Again, a third instance, after parting from the old church member, he met the youngest sister of them all. It was a maiden newly won, and won by the Reverend Dimmesdale's own sermon on the Sabbath after his vigil, to barter the transitory pleasure of the world for the heavenly hope that was to assume a brighter substance as life grew dark around her, and which would gild the utter gloom with final glory. She was fair and pure as a lily that had bloomed in paradise. The minister knew well that he was himself enshrined within the stainless sanctity of her heart, which hung its snowy its snowy curtains about his image, imparting to religion the warmth of love, and to love a religious purity. Satan, that afternoon, had surely led the poor young girl away from her mother's side and thrown her into the pathway of this sorely tempted, or, shall we not rather say, this lost and desperate man. As he drew nigh, the archfiend whispered him to condense into small compass and drop into her tender bosom a germ of evil that would sure, be sure to blossom darkly soon and bear black fruit betimes. Such was his sense of power over this virgin soul, trusting him as she did, that the minister felt potent to blight all the field of innocence with, with but one wicked look, and develop all its opposite with but a word. So, with a mightier struggle than he had yet sustained, he held his Geneva cloak before his face and hurried onward, making no sign of recognition, and leaving the young sister to digest his rudeness as she might. She ransacked her conscience, conscience, which was full of harmless little matters like her pocket or her working ba work bag, and took herself to task, poor thing, for a thousand imaginary faults, and went about her household duties with swollen eyelids the next morning. Before the minister had time to celebrate his victory over this last temptation, he was conscious of another impulse, more ludicrous and almost as horrible. It was, we blush to tell it, it was to stop short in the road and teach some very wicked words to a knot of little Puritan children who were playing there and had just begun to talk. Denying himself this freak as unworthy of his cloth, he met a drunken seaman, one of the ship's crew from the Spanish main, and here, since he had so violently forborne all other wickedness, poor Mr. Dimmesdale longed at least to shake hands with the tarry blackguard and re recreate himself with a few improper jests such as dissolute sailors so abound with, and a volley of good, round, solid, satisfactory, and heaven-defying oaths. It was not so much a better principle as partly his natural good taste and still more buckrammed habit of clerical decorum that carried him safely through the latter crisis. "'What is it that haunts and tempts me thus?' cried the minister to himself, at length, pausing in the street and striking his hand against his forehead. "'Am I mad, or am I given over utterly to the fiend? Did I make contract with him in the forest and sign it with my blood? And does he now summon me to its fulfillment by suggesting the performance of every wickedness which his most foul imagination can conceive. At the moment when the Reverend Mr. Dimmesdale thus communed, communed with himself and struck his forehead with his hand, old Mistress Hibbins, the reputed witch lady, is said to have been passing by. She made a very grand appearance, having on a high headdress, a rich gown of velvet, and a ruff done up with the famous yellow starch, of which Anne Turner, her especial friend, had taught her the secret before this last good lady had been hanged for Sir Thomas Overbury's murder. Whether the witch had read the minister's thoughts or no, she came to a full stop, looked shrewdly into his face, smiled craftily, and, though little given to com converse with clergymen, began a conversation. "'So, Reverend Sir, you made a visit into the forest,' observed the witch lady, nodding her high, high headdress at him. The next time I pray you to allow me only a fair warning, and I shall be proud to bear your I shall be proud to bear you company. Without take, taking over much upon myself, my good word will go for will go far towards gaining any strange gentleman a fair reception from yonder potentate you wot of. I profess, madam, answered the clergyman with grave obeisance, such as the lady's rank demanded, and with his own good breeding made imperative. I profess on my conscience and character that I am utterly bewildered as to touching the purport of your words. I went not into the forest to seek a potentate, neither do I, at any future time, 
design a visit thither with a view to gaining the favor of such a personage. My one sufficient object was to greet that pious friend of mine, the Apostle Eliot, and rejoice with him over the many precious souls he hath won from heathendom. Ha, 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 cackled the old lady witch, still nodding her high headdress at the minister. Well, well, we must needs th talk thus in the daytime. You carry it off like an old hand, but at midnight in the forest we shall have other talk together. She passed on with her aged stateliness, but often turning back her head and smiling at him, like one willing to recognize a secret intimacy of connection. Have I then sold myself, thought the minister, to the fiend whom, if, if men say true, this yellow-starched and velveted old hag has chosen for her prince and master? The wretched minister! He made a bargain. He had made a bargain very like it. Tempted by a dream of happiness, he had yielded himself with deliberate choice, as he had never done before, to what he knew was deadly sin, and the infectious poison of that sin had thus been had been thus rapidly diffused throughout his moral system. It had stupefied all blessed impulses and awakened into vivid life the whole brotherhood of bad ones. Scorn, bitterness, unprovoked malignity, gratuitous desire of ill, ridicule of whatever was good and holy, all awoke to tempt, even while they frightened him. And his encounter with old Mistress Hibbins, if it were a real incident, did but show his sympathy and fellowship with wicked mortals and the world of perverted spirits. He had, by this time, reached his dwelling on the edge of the burial ground, and, hastening up the stairs, took refuge in his study. The minister was glad to have reached this shelter, without first betraying himself to the world by any of those strange and wicked eccentricities to which he had been continually impelled while passing through the streets. He entered the accustomed room, and looking around him on its books, its windows, its fireplace, and the tapestried comfort of the walls, with the same perception of strangeness that had haunted him throughout his walk from the forest dell into the town and thitherward. Here he had studied and written, here gone, th gone through fast and vigil, and come forth half alive, here striven to pray, here borne a hundred thousand agonies. There was the Bible, in its rich old Hebrew, with Moses and the prophet speaking to him, and God's voice through all. There on the table, with the inky pen beside it, was an unfinished sermon, with a sentence broken in the midst, where his thoughts had ceased to gush, gush out upon the page two days before. He knew that it was himself, the thin and white-cheeked minister, who had done and suffered these things, and had written thus far into the election sermon. But he seemed to stand apart, and I, this former self, with scornful, pitying, but half-envious curiosity. That self was gone. Another man had returned out of the forest, a wiser one, with a knowledge of hidden mysteries, which the simplicity of the former never could have reached. A bitter kind of knowledge, that. While occupied with these reflections, a knock came at the door of the study, and the minister said, Come in, not wholly devoid of an idea that he might behold an evil spirit. And so he did. It was old Roger Chillingworth that entered. The minister stood, white and speechless, with one hand on the Hebrew scriptures, and the other spread upon his breast. Welcome home, reverend sir, said the physician. And how found you that godly man, the apostle Eliot? But, methinks, dear sir, you look pale, as if the travel through the wilderness had been too sore for you. Will not my aid be requisite to put you in heart and strength to preach your election sermon? Nay, I think not so, rejoined the Reverend Mr. Dimmesdale. My journey in the sight of the holy apostle yonder, and the free air which I have breathed, have done me good after so long confinement in my study. I think to need no more of your drugs, my kind physician, good though they be, and administered by friendly hand. All this time Roger Chillingworth was looking at the minister with the grave and intent regard of a physician towards his patient, but in spite of this outward show, the latter was almost convinced of the old man's knowledge, or at least his confident suspicion with respect to his own interview with Hester Prynne. The physician knew then that, in the minister's regard, he was no longer a trusted friend, but his bitterest enemy. So much being known, it would be appear natural that a part of it should be expressed. It is singular, however, how long a time often passes before words embody things, and with what security two persons who choose to avoid a certain subject may approach its very verge 
and retire without disturbing it. Thus the minister felt no apprehension that Roger Chillingworth would touch in express words upon the real position which they sustained towards one another. Yet did the physician, in his dark way, creep frightfully near the secret. Were it not better, said he, that you use my poor skills tonight? Verily, dear sir, we must take pains to make you strong and vigorous for this occasion of election discourse. The people look for great things from you, apprehending that another year may come about and find their pastor gone. Yea, to another world, replied the minister with pious resignation. Heaven grant it be a better one, for, in good sooth, I can hardly think to tarry with my flock through the flitting seasons of another year. But, touching your medicine, kind sir, in my present frame of body, I need it not. I joy to hear it, answered the physician. It may be that my remedies, so long administered in vain, begin now to take due effect. Happy man were I, and well deserving of New England's gratitude, could I re achieve this cure. I thank you 